Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera where in today's video I'm going to be describing the Mamiya 6 K2 folding medium format camera which uses 120 roll film. Uh, before I get into the camera review I thought I'd update you uh, on a few things which have happened in Japan. Uh, a lot of you uh, know that it's been a while since I last posted a video here, uh, not since before the new year. Uh, the last uh, almost three weeks here have been quite hectic. Uh, first, we had the big earthquake on January 1st, and though that didn't affect us very much here in Tokyo, uh, it has caused a kind of a disruption in things, and uh, uh, we, we uh, of course, been following the news about what has been going on in Ishikawa, and we donated some uh, money and supplies to be sent there to uh, help the people who need it. Uh, Ishikawa is a very beautiful place. The people are very nice there. And it's a place we like to go out to, the, the Noto area, uh, to enjoy the hot springs there. So uh, they're doing quite well there now. They've finally managed to get uh, uh, everyone uh, rescued or recovered and working on get, getting everyone housed and getting things rebuilt. Japan is very efficient about these things. And uh, it, it's kind of tragic when things like earthquakes happen in Japan, especially the bigger ones. But uh, a few places uh, are as good at Japan when it comes to dealing with these kind of disasters. Uh, the next big issue which happened here, of course, was the uh, air crash at Haneda Airport, which happened uh, the very next day after the uh, uh, earthquake. And uh, this was something which affected me personally. Uh, you know, fortunately, uh, uh, it, it could have been a much worse disaster than it was. No one on the airliner was uh, uh, killed or seriously hurt. Uh, unfortunately, five of the crew members on the Coast Guard plane were uh, killed uh, it was a, a very difficult day and, a, and kind of like a, you know, uh, the second of a one-two punch of a, uh, a bad start to the new year. Uh, in regards to myself, uh, of course, a lot of you know I sell cameras here in Japan and uh, I export 99% of these uh, cameras to other countries. And most of my shipments go through Haneda Airport. And Haneda Airport was closed for a few days for the investigation. And after that, when it reopened, it opened on kind of a, a limited basis. And uh, it took a little while before it was getting up to full speed. And the result of the closure and the limited operation was a huge backup in packages and things uh, being sent out of the country. And unfortunately, a lot of these were mine. So uh, those of you who uh, ordered cameras from my stores, you might have noticed that uh, you weren't able to track them for a long time or still may not be able to track them. Uh, everything has been shipped. Everything is on its way. Most things have already arrived. But uh, if, you're, if you've experienced delays or issues like that, uh, that's what happened. So let's go ahead and get started with the subject of this video. Now that I'm uh, three minutes into it, and uh, what I'm going to be describing today is a really cool camera and one which I regard as one of the best of the medium format folding cameras and that is the Mamiya 6K2. Now Mamiya uh, sold a lot of Mamiya 6 cameras. There were a huge variety of these. They were produced for uh, uh, 15, nearly 20 years. Uh, and uh, you know, from very simple uh, primitive uh, cameras to the more sophisticated ones like the one I'm holding here and pretty much everything in between. And uh, though they produced a lot of the uh, medium format folding cameras, the one which I most commonly sell is this particular model. And that is because this is the most reliable uh, and easy to service of the Mamiya 6 uh, cameras. Uh, the, the Achilles heel, the big weakness to the Mamiya 6 uh, is usually the lens. And most of these cameras, more than 90% of them, were sold with the Olympus D Zuiko lens, which, when it's in good condition, is a stellar lens, a really wonderful performer, uh, very highly regarded. But unfortunately, the quality of the glass in the Zuiko lens in the 1940s and 50s was not very high. Or It was optically good, but its durability wasn't high. And if the cameras are stored in a, I guess, environment where they get hot and cold, which is what pretty much Japan is. Japan is very much a, a country with four seasons here. Uh, the coating on the insides of the lens deteriorates and the, deteri the deterioration eats into the glass itself and this causes a permanent haze on the glass which isn't removable. And no matter how hard you try to clean or polish or whatever, it's, you, know, you can never get rid of all of the haze. And so uh, if you're lucky enough to come across a Mamiya 6 with a clean uh, Olympus Zuiko lens, 
uh, you're like one of the one in 10 people who have such a camera. A nine out of 10 are going to have at least some amount of haze on them. Uh, a little bit of haze isn't going to be really noticeable when you're using the camera, but most of these uh, cameras have enough haze on the lens where it has a negative effect on the image quality. Now, uh, a couple models of the Mamiya 6 didn't come with the Olympus Zuiko lens. They came with either the Setagaya Koki lens, which the K2 has, or the, the Komenar lens. And th uh, these lenses are, uh, they're every good bit as good uh, uh, performers as the Zuiko lens, but with the added benefit that they don't deteriorate over time. So if you're hunting for one of these cameras, unless you can look at it personally up close, uh, you should avoid the cameras with the Azuiko lenses and try to look only for cameras which have the Koki or Kominar lenses. Uh, then you won't have the uh, issue with the haze. So uh, let's go ahead and take a more detailed look at the Mamiya 6 K2. And here you can see it's unfolded and everything is out in all of its uh, beautiful glory. Uh, this is a really wonderful camera, uh, a great lens, a nice shutter with a full range of speeds. And what is really wonderful about this camera is that it can shoot in two formats. It can shoot in the 6x4 5 portrait format or it can shoot in the 6x6 square format. Uh, the 6x4 5 format allows you to get an extra four uh, exposures out of a roll of film, which I, you know, the film has gotten uh, quite expensive in recent years. So um, this makes shooting medium format form more economical than it otherwise would. Uh, the camera features a very simple and reliable operating mechanism, uh, which is, uh, you know, it has less things to go wrong. I really love the design of the camera. And what is the best thing about the design of this camera is the focusing system. So on, on most cameras, uh, medium format folding cameras, um, the camera is focused by moving the lens. And this is done in a few different ways. Some of them you turn the front lens element, and as the lens elements open and close, that changes the focus on the film. Uh, other ones, when you focus, it turns the entire lens, and you'll see the entire lens assembly moving forward and backward. Uh, still other cameras, rather than moving the lens, the entire lens uh, panel on the front moves in and out. And while all these are good systems, uh, Mamiya took all these and made a, you know, a, and abandoned them and came up with a, a simple design where the camera focuses by moving the film plane in the back in and out. So you can focus the camera whether the, you know, uh, uh, the, the camera is folded or unfolded. You can pre-focus the camera. One issue with uh, uh, the uh, cameras with the lenses which move, you have to put them back to infinity uh, before you fold the camera or it won't close on the front. Whereas this camera, you can focus it from infinity to close focus with the front cover closed. So if you want to, if you're like one of those street shooters uh, who likes to preset your focus, you can simply do that with the focusing ring and using the focus indicator here on the top. And you have this uh, focusing scale here, which shows you how much depth of field you have, or depth of field scale, showing how much of depth of field you have at any given aperture. So this makes this camera uh, actually a very good street shooter and one which can be operated very quickly compared to other uh, medium format cameras. Another good thing about this camera compared to some of the other versions is this uh, system here. A lot of the Mamiya 6 cameras have a, uh, a panel or a bezel which is glued on or screwed onto the top here and it tends to come off and get lost. And certain of these cameras, uh, maybe half of them are missing uh, this uh, depth of field scale. It's not a fatal thing to the camera as long as you're focusing the camera carefully with the uh, uh, range finder, uh, you're going to be able to get a properly focused image. But if you're one of those people who uh, you know wants to know how much depth of depth of uh, uh, field you have, uh, the scale is kind of interesting to have because you can't really preview it in, the, uh, in a medium format camera like this as you can in uh, like a, an SLR camera where you can stop down the aperture as you look through the viewfinder. So uh, yeah, that, that's kind of a weakness. If you come across one of those cameras, you can still use it, but try to find one which is either a later model with has it engraved in the top or where the, the, the bezel isn't missing. And if you have one with the bezel, Make sure that it's glued on tight and isn't loose. Uh, if it is loose, take it off, put some more glue in and stick it back on uh, so you won't lose it. So let's go ahead and take a look at the features, controls, and functions. And keep in mind, this is a camera which I haven't worked on yet. Uh, this one just arrived in the mail the other day. So um, there, there may be a few flaws to it, but uh, they will be fixed up before I put it up for sale. 
So let's go ahead and take a look at the top. And the first thing we have here is the uh, winding knob here. And it's a one-way knob. It'll turn to the right, but not to the left. But if you turn it hard to the left, you can remove the knob. And that makes the camera very easy to maintain compared to some other medium format cameras. And I'll explain a little bit on how to maintain it uh, later in the video. Uh, on the top of the uh, film winding dial, we have the film speed adjustment dial, which you set by simply, there are a couple of uh, nubs here, which you can use to turn until the window on the top shows the same film speed you have loaded in the camera. Uh, keep in mind that this is only a reminder. It doesn't have any effect on the actual operation of the camera. You can set this to whatever number you want and the camera is going to work you know, the same regardless. This is just so you don't forget what kind of film you have loaded in. And there was a time when there were several different kinds of films available. There still are today. Uh, black and white, slide film, color film. So you can use this to remind you which you have, but more than likely nowadays you're probably only going to shoot one kind of film anyway. But it, it's there. Over here we have a shoe for mounting a flash gun and you can use a flash with this camera by simply uh, plugging in your flash to the PC sync socket here on the top of the lens. Uh, this camera will work with a vintage bulb flash, it will work with a vintage strobe flash, or it will work with a modern strobe flash. Uh, just follow the directions on the flash you are using. Over here we have the shutter release button which accepts a standard cable release and I believe I've already mentioned the depth of field scale here. Uh, moving to the back of the camera, we have the viewfinder window, and this is removable. You can take it off and take out the glass and clean it. And you can also clean the rear lens of the uh, uh, viewfinder mechanism on the inside, so you can get at least a little bit cleaner without taking apart the camera. Over here, we have the focusing wheel. And here we have this cap screw, and if you remove this cap screw, underneath that you will find the adjusting screw for uh, the uh, uh, adjustment for the range finder. So there are two adjustments for the range finder. There's a vertical and horizontal adjustment. Uh, the horizontal adjustment you find here and the vertical adjustment you'll find under the cover here on the top. You remove this small screw, slide out the shoe, and there will be a hole on the top which is just above the uh, adjusting screw for the range finder. On the back here we have the covers which uh, cover the film counter windows. There are two film counter windows. One is for 6x45 and one is for 6x6. Uh, whenever you are using the camera, you simply uh, wind the camera until the next exposure number comes up in the window. You take the photograph, then you wind it until the next number lines up, and so on and so on. You have 12 exposures of uh, a 6x6 format and 16 exposures in the 6x45 format. Now, uh, I'll go ahead and describe briefly, or not so briefly, depends on... Uh, how cranky this camera is, how to load the film, and how to uh, set the format. So the first thing you do is you open the, the film door, and on the bottom here of this side, you will see the, the two different settings for 6x45 and 6x6, and you can simply move this switch up and down to switch between them. Uh, here we have the pressure plate, and we have a, let's see if I can go ahead and get that to flop back down. We have doors here on the bottom. Let me take out the take up spool here. And these doors, of course, I, I mentioned this probably be a little bit cranky. You can usually uh, get them to uh, pop open and fold over like so. And when these doors are, of course, it's going to be a little bit difficult. I kind of expect that. But uh, when you close the doors here, you will have the 6x4.5 format. And when you open them like so, you will have the 6x6 format. So you can't change formats while you have a, a, a roll of film loaded in the camera. You have to set the format before you do it. Uh, for loading the film, uh, quite easy. You take your take-up spool. You lift up the uh, catch in the bottom. And you line up the spool on the counter. And medium format cameras are always a little bit tricky because they make this just so, just so it barely fits inside. You pop in the take up spool, you put in the film spool on this side the exact same way. You pull your film across the opening here behind the rear of the lens and feed it into the take up spool and simply wind it until the paper shows the arrow on the back. Be careful to put in the film the right way. It can be put in 
the wrong way. There are two ways to put it in and uh, depending on the camera you are using, some cameras require it to be the opposite is here. Uh, if you're putting it in this camera, you should have the paper showing on the back with the colors and the numbers and the, the, the film name and all that stuff. And you simply keep winding until an arrow comes across and lines up more or less in the middle of the camera. Then you push down the back of the pressure plate, lock this latch into place, and then you would close the film door, push down the latch, and simply start winding until uh, the number one lines up in the middle of the red window. And once that happens, the camera is ready to shoot. So that's pretty much everything for the back of the camera. On the bottom, all we have is a tripod socket. There's a standard quarter inch uh, socket located off to the side. On the front of the camera, we have a selector switch on the top here, which allows you to switch between the 6x45 format and 6x6 format. This is a much better system than what comes on other cameras. Uh, other cameras, which are multi-format cameras like uh, Super Ecantas and things like that, often they just have a colored film, a small piece on either side, so you can, you know, there's no way to select between the formats. You just have to remember that you have the camera is set in the back to, you know, the the baffle set to 6x45 or 6x6, and just remember to look through the proper ones. Whereas this one here, uh, if you're shooting a 6x45, that's all you're going to see. So if you've loaded it and set the baffles to 6x45, and you have this set over, there aren't going to be any mistakes. So I, I think this is a superior system than what they have on a lot of the other cameras. Uh, one another issue with these cameras, this button on the front often comes off. It's just screwed in. If it's missing, you can open the front door by just using a small screwdriver or a pointy object and put it inside where the threaded hole for the catch is and just pull downward and it will open. You can replace this with a, a small uh, screw and uh, just screw it in enough to where it sticks out enough where it moves up and down, but don't screw it tight against the front. And you can open and close the camera camera opens like so. When you open the camera, don't let it flop open like that. Kind of open it carefully and make sure that the mechanism here for the shutter is properly lined up. It's possible if the camera is not opened carefully that it opens misaligned and then when you try to uh, actuate the shutter, uh, the actuator is kind of on that. You can see that moving right there. Uh, that's supposed to push the shutter button on the bottom. It's possible to open it too quickly or open it wrongly and they get crossed up on the wrong side and then the shutter won't operate. And that isn't unique to this camera. It's an issue you can have with other folding cameras. So be careful when you open it. So uh, all the important controls on the camera are on the lens. This is a, a lens shutter camera. Uh, the shutter is located between the lens elements and all the important settings are located here. On the front we have the uh, uh, it's knurled around here and this camera except what is called a slide on filter which slides around the outside you can kind of you can unscrew the the front lens assembly like so and that uh, allows you to get access inside the camera to uh, clean the lens elements if they're dirty or have fungus or whatever unfortunately the koki and kominar lenses are very easy to clean and it's not so easy to mess up the coating on them so uh, if the lens is dirty and you have a k2 or similar camera at cleaning it's quite simple you simply uh, open the shutter like so and open the aperture and that allows you to clean the glass very easily it also allows you to clean the shutter and aperture blades if they're a little bit oily the front and rear elements can be removed these old cameras were very user friendly or user serviceable compared to newer cameras uh, and if you're like if you like camera repair or want something you can work on yourself these are a really great camera for that we have the uh, aperture ring located here in the back and uh, as you move it you can see the small arrow kind of moving back and forth as I rotate the ring. We have a shut an aperture range of f3.5 to f22 and as this is a medium format camera you can use smaller apertures without diffraction and if you're going to be using one of these you know uh, to, to get the best possible performance it's better to use not to shoot the lens so wide open and try to keep it you know at, at, at least uh, you know f8 or f11 that or maybe even f16 that will give you the best performance you can even use f22 without worrying about the diffraction like you would like on, on a medium on a 35 millimeter ca uh, camera uh, it, these cameras are very well suited to long exposures at small apertures and to catch a lot of detail uh, here we have the shutter charging lever. Uh, you simply pull it over each time you want to take an exposure. Needless to say, taking double, triple, or infinite exposures is quite easy. 
I already mentioned previously the PC sync socket for using a flash. And in the front of that we have the uh, shutter speed ring and we have a range of shutter speeds from bulb and one second up to one three hundredth of a second and one three hundredth of a second is completely adequate for a medium format camera. On the bottom we have a self timer and this is one of those cameras which I recommend that you don't use the self timer because it's uh, this is this camera has one of the least reliable self timers. Try not to touch it. Uh, you know, don't experiment with it. If your camera, if the shutter is working, uh, don't mess with the self timer. Just leave it alone because uh, odds are you know, the odds are maybe one in three that if you pull the self timer and charge it, it's not going to discharge. The camera will just stick. The self timer will stick, and then the shutter won't work anymore. It is sometimes possible. In this case, this one is kind of working. Uh, kind of. It's not it, to the end of its life yet. It's not working as well as it should, but uh, at least you know, it won't jam up the camera. Uh, if you have one of these cameras and the self timer is jammed, you can do like I just did, give it a little bit of a push or a nudge, and sometimes that will get it working. If it's still not working, hold the camera upside down. Be careful not to damage the bellows when you handle the camera or turn it upside down. I put a few drops of a solvent or lighter fluid or something and let it run down. And let gravity pull it down to the uh, self-timer mechanism. And sometimes that will unlock it and it will start working or it will allow you to push it. And, and you can push it until it uh, winds down and the shutter opens. And if worse comes to worse and it simply doesn't work, you can unscrew the front lens like so. And there's a ring here which you can unscrew. You can take off the two plates here and uh, you can remove the, the self timer and then put the camera back together. Fortunately, as I said, this is a very uh, user friendly camera, easy to maintain. And uh, if you can't get it lubricated and working or cleaned out, you can simply remove it and, and do without. And the camera, you know, you're probably better off without it because uh, you know, even if it's working now, there will be a day sometime in the future where it isn't working. Uh, to operate the camera, very simple. When you have uh, film loaded in it, you wind to the next exposure, lining up the exposure. Uh, using your light meter, you set the appropriate uh, shutter speed and aperture. And then you would uh, focus, uh, compose, and whoop, I should charge the shutter, and shoot. And, and that's pretty much all there is to it. Uh, a few things to be careful with on these cameras. Uh, be careful with the bellows. Uh, be careful when you handle the camera, when you're folding it, that you don't touch it or damage it or whatever. Uh, try not to get in a situation where in tricky places where you might drop the camera and catch it and stick your thumb or finger through the bellows because these are extremely difficult to replace and parts are hard to find. Par you know, parts are hard to find, so uh, you, you don't want to damage the bellows. If you're shopping for one of these cameras, of course, try to avoid the ones which have the Zuiko lens. The easy way to tell is the Koki and Komenar lenses have a thick chrome ring around the front. You can kind of see it here, whereas the uh, Zuiko lenses have a thin chrome ring around the front. So even if you can't see that it says Olympus or Setagaya Koki, um, just the, the wide ring will means that it has the better lens in it. Uh, other issues to watch for, uh, the bellows, the lens, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, opening the camera carefully. Uh, cleaning the camera, I said I would talk, tell you a little bit about how to clean the camera. It's incredibly simple. The viewfinder mechanism, simply unscrew uh, the winding cap. There's always a spring here. This one's missing the spring for some reason. Remove the three screws on the top here and the entire top cover lifts off. Be careful not to lose the shutter button because that will come out with the, the top. And underneath you'll see uh, uh, the optics for the viewfinder rangefinder system. There's a dust cover underneath here on top of the rangefinder held on with two screws. Remove the two screws and take off the cover. And with cotton swabs you can clean out pretty much everything inside the viewfinder rangefinder system. There is a beam splitting mirror which sits diagonally like this across of the inside of the viewfinder. You can clean the front of the beam splitting mirror but do not clean the back because the reflective clothing will come off. Uh, nine out of ten times it will come off and then the rangefinder simply won't work on the camera anymore. Uh, you can clean, even if it's dirty on the back side, really dirty, if you clean the rest of the optics in it you'll make a big improvement in the, the, the viewfinder, uh, you know, how clear it is and also in the rangefinder itself. 
And when you put it back together, simply uh, put the shutter button back in the, the pointy end. You know, there, there's a, it's kind of a triangle on the bottom. Uh, you want the triangle end to be kind of facing toward uh, away from the, uh, the triangle end should face this way and the round end face that way. Then put in the three screws, put on the this cover here, which comes off like so. Put the cover back on, put the spring back on, screw this back on, and the camera is ready to go. So, kind of a long video here, but I hope you've learned something about the Mamiya 6K2. Uh, this camera, I believe I have one of these already listed in my online store. I don't have any at my Etsy store at the moment, but um, I'll go ahead and list this one soon, as soon as I get it uh, cleaned up. Fortunately, I have extra springs and parts for these cameras, so this one will be 100% uh, when it's ready to go. And of course, I've got more cameras available, so yeah, uh, if it, the Mamiya 6K2 isn't your thing, maybe you'll see something else you like. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again soon.